So uh, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to, uh, to give us a tutorial. There's been a lot of uh, interest uh, in our department and of course elsewhere. Um, and Dr. Yang Song is currently at OpenAI and joining um, Caltech in 24, you said, as an assistant professor. Um, so we are very excited to hear about diffusion and score-based generative models. So please take it away. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. So I will be giving you a tutorial on diffusion models. Uh, this tutorial is a little bit different because I will approach diffusion from the perspective of a score matching and score-based genetic models. So in this talk, you can view score-based genetic models as an interchangeable term with diffusion models. So I'm using score-based genetic models because I hope to emphasize the connection of them to score functions. So score functions, are defined as gradients of log probability densities. By modeling and estimating this quantity, we can build very flexible and powerful probabilistic genetic models that can give us uh, very high quality samples and also predict accurate probability values. So uh, in this talk, I will mostly cover the research I did during my PhD at Stanford. And uh, this line of research is impossible without the help of many collaborators, mentors, and friends whose names are listed below. So uh, let's start by briefly reviewing the recent progress of deep genetic models in various applications. So nowadays, we are able to build very powerful image genetic models that can create realistic pictures from text description. So here is an example provided by DALI2, which is a model developed by OpenAI. And you can find similar pictures generated from uh, imaging or stable diffusion. And similar success has been extended to video generation as well. And this is an example uh, generated from imaging video, which is a model developed by Google Brain very recently. And deep genetic models are also very useful for many scientific applications. This, this video shows you an example of using deep genetic models to predict the radar maps for weather now casting. And DeepMind has demonstrated that this approach can even outperform human experts on weather now casting. We can also use deep genetic models to help us automatically complete code in order to maximize the productivity of computer programmers. And this is an example uh, of using a language model for generating uh, the code given comments of the computer program. So this technology has already been deployed to products uh, and you might have known it as GitHub Copilot. So, we have so many important applications of deep genetic models. And you may ask, how can we build such powerful genetic models? So it turns out that almost all genetic models, they follow the same pipeline. And the basic idea is to estimate the probability distribution of data. So in order to build a deep genetic model, the first thing we need to do is to collect a large data set. And as a running example, Let's suppose the data set contains many images of dogs. A typical assumption in statistics and machine learning is that all those data points in our training data set came from some underlying data distribution. In other words, those data points are basically ID samples from this data distribution, but we don't have the analytical form of the data distribution and we have to estimate it. And to estimate this data distribution, we have to create a model. This model represents a parameterized probability distribution, which we call the model distribution. And we hope to tune this model parameter to make sure this model distribution is close to the data distribution in certain sense. So if this model distribution is very close to the data distribution, then we can use the model for many important applications. And one example is, of course, we can generate an unlimited number of novel data points just by sampling from this model distribution. Another application is we can use this model distribution to compute the probability value for any potential data point. So as an example for a data point, like a picture of a chihuahua, 
because it is a picture of a dog, it is actually within our data distribution. And therefore, this model distribution usually assigns high probability values for such data points. For some irrelevant data point, like a picture <laughs> of a muffin, because it is not a picture of a dog, a good model distribution will assign lower probability values to such images. So because this model distribution provides a way to generate novel data points, we also refer to it as a genetic model. So how can we train those genetic models? As we know, we have a large data set. We may formalize the problem a little bit further. So we can use symbols like xi to represent each data point in the data set. And we have a total of n data points. And our model provides a family of probability distributions. And we hope to find a single probability distribution inside this huge family by minimizing the distance from P data mm. to P theta. And afterwards, we can just generate samples from P theta. However, there is one key challenge associated with this framework. That is our data distribution can be extremely complicated, especially for data with high dimensions. So consider how complicated it might be for distributions of images, video, audio. It might have millions of dimensions. And as a result, we have to build a very powerful model distribution in order to estimate our data distribution. So how can we build a powerful model distribution? Let's recall that in statistics, we often work with simple distributions, such as a Gaussian distribution. Of course, a Gaussian distribution is too, too simple. It won't be able to approximate our complicated data distribution, but it serves as a good starting point. So uh, a Gaussian distribution is basically a computational graph that has two layers. The first layer corresponds to the input data point. The second layer is a single unit that basically gives you the probability density function of this Gaussian distribution. So this computation is very simple. And the mu in this slide denotes the mean parameter of this Gaussian distribution. By changing the parameter mu, you are basically changing the mean of this Gaussian. But as we said, Gaussian models are too simple. How can we make a more complicated model? Well, one very natural idea is to leverage a bigger and deeper computational graph. And we also call it a deep neural network. So we hope to use a deep neural network to represent a complicated probability distribution, P theta, where theta denotes the weights in this deep neural network. <clears throat> And when we use deep neural networks to build those powerful genetic models, we obtain deep genetic models. But it is actually non-trivial to use a deep neural network to directly represent a probability distribution because we typically view a deep neural network as a black box that converts a high dimensional input X to a typically one dimensional output F data. So this output value at data does not directly model distribution because it may not be positive everywhere. So one well, first step to convert this into a probability density is to take the exponential of the output so that the output becomes positive. And then we can normalize the output by dividing by a constant z theta in order to construct a probability distribution which has positive values everywhere and is also properly normalized. So the denominator here is called the normalizing constant. And by definition, this normalizing constant should be computed by evaluating the high dimensional integral of the exponential function of f theta over all possible values of x in the space. In the special case of Gaussian models, this normalizing constant is very simple to compute because f theta in Gaussian models has a very simple form, so we can directly compute the integral in closed form. But when we are trying to handle more powerful deep neural network models, this normalizing constant becomes intractable to compute. And as a quick example, even if we consider a simplified case where x is discrete, 
and in which case the integral becomes a summation, computing this normalizing constant is still a sharply complete problem, which is at least as hard as NP complete. And this difficulty is by no means the unique challenge in deep genetic modeling. You can find many similar challenges in adjacent fields such as thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And people have been studying this problem for quite a while. In the current literature of deep genetic models, there are mostly three approaches to address this intractable normalizing constant difficulty. And uh, uh, as a result, we can actually categorize deep genetic models into three different categories or families. So the first category is based on approximating this normalizing constant using approaches such as Markov chain Monte Carlo. So one typical example inside this family is energy-based models trained by contrastive divergence. So the disadvantage of this direction is that because we have to approximate this normalizing constant, we cannot compute the probability value accurately since the probability value requires dividing by this approximate normalizing constant. The second major approach is based on using restricted neural network models such that this normalizing constant is tractable by construction. So there are a few examples inside this family. But the challenge is that once we restrict our neural network models, we also limit the flexibility of deep genetic models that we can potentially build along this direction. So the last category is based on modeling the data generating process directly instead of modeling the probability density function. So the most predominant example in this family is generative out of serial networks. However, because those approaches do not model the underlying data distribution, they cannot give us accurate probability values. So these are a few challenges associated with previous genetic modeling frameworks. And if we want to address those difficulties by proposing a better framework of genetic modeling, then we require this better framework to satisfy certain test data. And one thing is we hope this better framework can allow us to use very flexible neural network models uh, to parameterize this distribution. So this not only addresses the second challenge on the left side, but also allows us to take full advantage of the deep learning revolution to leverage very powerful deep neural networks to build our uh, to build our deep genetic models. The second distortion is we hope to evaluate probability probability values accurately using this new framework of genetic modeling. So if we can evaluate the probability values accurately, we can address the rest challenges on the left side. And moreover, those accurate probability values are very important for applications such as outlier detection, model comparison, or lossless compression. And finally, because we are aiming to build a more powerful framework of genetic models, we of course want to generate samples with better quality. So not only do we want to generate samples with better quality, we also want to control this generation process in a principled way so that we may use this gentle model for numerous downstream applications. And one example is medical image reconstruction, which I will discuss briefly later in the tutorial. So now in today's talk, I will show you one such framework that satisfies all three distorata listed here. And the key of this framework is to work with score functions to represent our probability distribution. So what is the score function? Well, suppose we have a continuous probability distribution where we use Px to represent the probability density function. We define the score function as the gradient of log Px. So this quantity has multiple names. It can be called as the Stein score function to differentiate from Fisher score functions that typically appear in statistics. It can also be called as the score function or simply score. So be careful this gradient is taken with respect to the random variable x. It is not taken with respect to any model parameter like theta. So what does our score function look like? Let's consider a simple example, which is a mixture of two Gaussians. 
in this figure uh, shows the density function and the score function for this mixture of Gaussian distribution. The density function is uh, color coded where a darker color indicates higher density. The score function is a vector field that gives the direction where the density function grows most quickly. So given the density function, we can compute the score function very easily because we can just take the derivative. Conversely, with the score function, we can also recover the density function in principle by computing integrals. So mathematically, this score function preserves all the information in the density function. So they are equivalent to a certain sense. But computationally, this score function is much easier to work with compared to the density function. So when we work with the score function for representing probability distributions, we get our score-based genetic models. And I will show you that this score-based genetic models has multiple advantages. So first, it allows very flexible models because the score functions actually do not need to be normalized at all, which means you can use very flexible neural network models, uh, neural network models to uh, represent this score function. And we can learn such models or score functions from data using principled statistical approaches. The second advantage is uh, we can directly generate samples from those models of score functions. And those samples could have surprisingly good quality and can be even better than girls in many situations. And moreover, we can control this sample generation process in a principled way for many important applications. And finally, even if we only have the model of the score function, we can still compute the probability values accurately. And empirically, we can even obtain better probability values compared to those models that directly work with probability density functions. So in the rest of the tutorial, I will first focus on how score-based genetic modeling allows very flexible models. So recall that one major difficulty in deep genetic modeling is due to the intractable normalizing constant problem when we are trying to model the probability density function. So indeed, if we want to model this probability distribution using uh, a, a normalized probability model, then no matter how we change our model parameters or model architectures or other configurations, we always have to ensure that the distribution that represented is fully normalized but in other words, the area below this curve has to be one. And due to, this constraint, due to this constraint, when we use the deep neural network to model those density functions, we always have to deal with this intractable normalizing constant uh, difficulty. But in contrast, if we model the same distribution through the score functions, then as the animation shows, there is no such normalization restriction. And in fact, if we compute the score function for the neural network on the left side, we notice that the score function is the difference of two terms. Only the second term involves the intractable normalizing constant. But the second term is always zero because the gradient of any constant is always zero. As a result, the score function equals the gradient of the deep neural network. And as you might know, those gradients of deep neural networks can be easily computed with automatic differentiation or with bank propagation. So this is a very efficient operation. And from now on, I will use the symbol S theta to denote such a deep neural network model for the score function. And I will call it a score model. Suppose we have collected a large training data set and again, we use x1, x2 to xn to denote each point in this data set. We assume the underlying data density is given by p data. With our knowledge in statistics, we know that we can train a properly, properly normalized statistical model to estimate the underlying data density using methods such as maximum likelihood. And because we want to work with the score functions, we want to develop a similar approach that can allow us to train a score model to estimate the underlying score function from a limited set of training data points. And we can formulate this problem as score estimation. 
So mathematically, we are given a bunch of data points, which are assumed to be ID sampled from the data distribution P data. And our goal is to estimate this score function of the data density. We are given a score model. This is, a, this is assumed to be a deep neural network model that maps a d-dimensional input to a d-dimensional output. And we hope to train this score model such that it approximates our ground truth score function of the data distribution. So how can we train this score model to be close to our ground truth data score function? Well, we need to minimize a certain objective. This objective has to compare two vector fields of score functions. Here, one vector field is the ground truth data score function. The other vector field is predicted by our score model. How can we compare their difference? Let's recall that those two vector fields actually lie in the same space. So we might be able to compute the different vectors between those pairs of vectors from the original vector fields. And then we can average over the lenses of those different vectors to form a single scalar valued objective. So mathematically, we can capture this intuition with the Fisher divergence objective. So Fisher divergence is essentially an unexpected squared Euclidean distance between the data score and the model score averaged over samples from the data distribution. However, Fisher divergence cannot be directly computed because we don't know the ground truth value of the data score function. But luckily, there is a way to address this challenge. And the method is called score matching. So score matching uses integration by parts or Gauss's theorem to convert Fisher divergence into the following equivalent objective. So the objective at the bottom is equivalent to Fisher divergence up to a constant. But since constants do not affect optimization, the score matching objective defines the same optimum as the Fisher divergence. So in the score matching objective, there is no dependency on the score function of the data distribution anymore. And moreover, the expectation in score matching can be efficiently approximated using the empirical mean over the training data set. So, so far so good. However, the score matching objective is not scalable to compute, especially when you want to use deep neural networks to model high dimensional data points. So let's suppose our score function is parametrized by a deep neural network, which we call deep score models. In order to use score matching, we have to compute two terms, where well, one term is the squared Euclidean norm of the uh, score, score model output. The second term is the choice of the Jacobian of the score model. So for the first term, it is super simple to compute and very efficient because we just need one forward propagation to get the output. Then we can compute the squared L2 norm very efficiently. For the second term, things become a little bit more complicated because we need one, pro one forward propagation to compute the first element of the score function output. And we need a bank propagation to compute the first element on the diagonal of this Jacobian. So this procedure has to be repeated multiple times until we have recovered all diagonal elements on the Jacobian. And then we can sum over the diagonal elements to get the trace. So this whole procedure requires a lot of bank propagations. And the, the number of bank propagations actually is proportional to the dimensionality of our data point. For modeling high dimension data like images, we might need to deal with millions of dimensions. And this means score matching in its naive form is not scalable. So to address this challenge, we actually propose a more efficient variant of a score matching, which we term sliced score matching. The basic intuition is that one dimensional problems should be much easier to solve than those high dimensional problems. And how can we convert a high dimensional problem to one dimensional problem? Well, we can leverage random projections. We project the high dimensional vector fields to run directions, then we get one dimensional scalar fields. So suppose those two high dimensional vector fields are close to each other. Then we can project them along random one dimensional directions. This gives us one dimensional scalar fields. Those scalar fields will also be close to each other. So we can capture this intuition with the concept of a sliced Fisher divergence. 
here V denotes the projection direction. It is a vector and PV denotes the distribution of those projection uh, directions. So we compute the inner product to V and those two score functions and measure the resulting difference between them. And we can again leverage integration by parts to eliminate the dependency on the ground truth data score. This gives us the sliced score matching objective. And in sliced score matching, there is no trace of a Jacobian anymore. Instead, we have vector Jacobian vector product. And this term is much more scalable to compute. So this is actually not hard to see because we can rewrite the vector Jacobian vector product as an alternative form on the right-hand side. So this just requires to swap the location of V and S theta within the gradient operator. So now I will show you how to compute this vector Jacobian vector product very efficiently. First, we just need one forward propagation to get the output of S theta. And then we can directly compute the inner product between V and S theta. So this amounts to adding one additional neuron to the computational graph. And next, we can compute the gradient by doing one bank propagation. And as the last step, we just need to compute the inner product in V and the gradient. So the whole procedure only requires one bank propagation, which is much more efficient compared to the vanilla form of score matching. So this is how slice score matching works in practice. We just sample a mini bunch of data points from our data set. And for each data point, we sample uh, one single projection direction from our distribution of PV. And then we form the empirical estimate of the slice score matching uh, training objective using the empirical mean over our sample data points and those projection directions. So the projection distribution PV is typically a simple standard Gaussian distribution, or sometimes better, you can use Rademacher distributions, which are uniformly di distributed sine vectors. And then we can use stochastic gradient descent to minimize our empirical objective for sliced score matching. And if you want a better performance or equivalently lower variance of our training objective, you could potentially use more projections per data point. So that concludes the discussion of a slice of score matching. There exists another approach called denoising score matching that can also bypass the computational challenge of vanilla score matching. The idea of denoising score matching is to add additional noise to the data point to help us compute the trace of the Jacobian term. So to perform the noise convention, we need to be, we need to design a perturbation kernel, which we denote as Q sigma. So Q, X tilde denotes the perturbed data point and X denotes the original noise free data point. Q sigma can typically be a Gaussian distribution with mean X and the standard deviation sigma. So after convolving this perturbation kernel with our original data distribution, we get a noisy data distribution Q sigma of X tilde. The key idea of denoising score matching is to estimate the score function of this noisy data density instead of the score function of the original data density. So of course, for sigma is very small, you can, run, you can approximately view the score function of the noisy density as equivalent to the score function of the noise-free density. So the magic happens when you estimate this score function of a noisy data distribution. So you can use some arithmetic derivation to write down an equivalent form to the denoising score matching objective, which I gave at the bottom of this slide. So in this new form, what we need to compute is just the gradient of the perturbation kernel. So because we designed the perturbation kernel by hand, usually this perturbation kernel is a fully tractable distribution. So computing this gradient is very efficient and it can be done analytically. But the drawback of the noise commenting is that since it requires any noise to data points, 
it cannot estimate scores of the noise-free distributions. And what's worse, when you are trying to lower the magnitude of the noise, the variance of denoise convention objective actually becomes bigger and bigger and eventually explode. So there is no easy way to use denoise convention for noise-free score estimation. So we can actually derive uh, the formula of denoise convention very easily, but I guess due to time reason, we skip this part. And uh, it's not hard to find this derivation from the original paper of denoise convention. So as a conclusion, when you want to apply denoise convention, you follow a similar procedure as slice convention. First of all, you sample a mini bunch of data points from the data density. And then you sample a mini bunch of perturbed data points. So usually for one data point, you sample a single perturbed data point by adding the additional amount of noise to perturb the chosen data point. And then you can form the empirical estimation of the denoise convention laws by approximating the expectation using empirical means. So in the special case of Gaussian perturbations, you can further simplify the denoise convention loss function. And then you can just apply stochastic gradient descent to minimize this objective function to train your score model. So in practice, if you want it to work well, for estimating score functions of noise-free data densities, you need to choose a very small sigma. But as I said, when sigma is very small, the variance of this objective will explode. So there is a trade-off and you need to find the sweet spot. So here are some experimental results. We first want to compare the computational efficiency of a sliced score matching and also the noise score matching versus the vanilla version of score matching. We consider the problem of training uh, energy-based models, or equivalently, we are considering the problem of training score functions from noise-free data. So the first figure shows how much time is needed to perform each iteration of various algorithms as a function of data dimensionality. So when data dimensionality increases, all those algorithms will take more time to perform one training iteration. But clearly, score matching in the color of a brown scales the worst. And in contrast, slices convention and denoise convention, which can be abbreviated as SSM and DSM in the figure, they scale much more preferably compared to score matching. And in terms of the actual performance of a score estimation, we report the results on the left figure. So the performance is, is better when the number is lower. So comparing Slice the score matching and score matching can see that even though slice the score matching uh, takes much less time to compute, they can still obtain more or less comparable performance as score matching uh, in terms of a score estimation. So really we gain a lot of computational boost at a small cost of the accuracy in score estimation. For denoising score matching DSM, um, because you have to inject noise to the data point. So the performance in score estimation is not as good as slice score matching. We want to estimate the score function of a clean data point. So everything is uh, well expected. So now I have discussed how working with score functions allow very flexible models because score functions bypass the challenge of normalizing constant. And we can use principled statistical methods like score matching, slice score matching, or denoising score matching to train those score models from data. For the next part, I will show you how can we generate samples from these models of score functions and how can we control this sample generation process in a principled way. So uh, as a quick recap, we know that given a large training data set, we can use principled statistical methods like score matching to train a score model to estimate the underlying score function. In order to build a genetic model, we have to find a certain approach to create new data points from the given vector field of score functions. So how can we do this? Well, suppose we are already given the score function and imagine that many random points scattered across the space. Can we move those random points to form samples from the score function? 
Well, one idea is we can potentially move those points by following the directions predicted by the score function. However, this will not give us valid samples because all those points will eventually collapse into each other. But this problem can be addressed if we follow a noisy version of the score function. So equivalently, we want to inject Gaussian noise to our score function and follow those noise perturbed score functions. So this method is the well-known approach of Langevin dynamics. And it is also well known that if we keep this sampling procedure long enough to reach convergence, and if we set the step size to be very, very small, the Langevin dynamics are guaranteed to give you the correct samples from the score function. So this is uh, uh, details of Langevin dynamics sampling. The goal is to sample from some density Px using only the score function, the gradient of Px. And the procedure of Langevin dynamics is as follows. First, we initialize our sample from some prior distribution. So this prior distribution can be very simple. It can be a Gaussian distribution. It can be a uniform distribution. And we repeat the following procedure multiple times. So in each of the sampling step, we first generate a random Gaussian vector from the standard Gaussian distribution. And, we, and then we modify X according to the following recurrence equation. So we basically update the previous sample using our score function plus a scaled version of the Gaussian noise vector. And if you set epsilon to something very close to zero, and if you set the total number of iterations, the capital T to be large enough, then we are guaranteed to, to obtain a valid sample from the underlying density of the score function. So now we know uh, score matching can estimate the score function of data and the Langevin dynamics can generate samples from the score function. So it becomes very, very natural to just replace the score function in Langevin dynamics with our score model. And then we can generate in data samples, we define a new genetic model. So this approach sounds very nice from the theoretical perspective, but it does not work well in practice. So here are the results of combining score matching and Langevin dynamics naively. The left figure shows some images from the CIFA-10 dataset. So CIFA-10 is a dataset that contains many images of a size 32 by 32. And the right figure shows you newly generated samples by combining score matching and the Langevin dynamics naively. So clearly you can see that the newly generated samples do not look realistic at all. So there has to be something very wrong with this simple naive approach. And in our research, we have identified several challenges. One interesting challenge is it is hard to estimate score functions accurately in low data density regions. So to illustrate, to illustrate this challenge, let's consider the toy example of a mixture of Gaussian distribution again. So the left figure shows you the ground truth density function. The middle figure shows you the ground truth score function. The rightmost figure gives you, gives you the estimated score function from score matching. If you compare those two vector fields, it's clear that the uh, estimated scores are accurate in high data density regions, which are given by those green boxes. But for low data density regions, the estimated scores are not accurate at all. So this is not totally unexpected because we use score matching to train our score model. And score matching compares the difference between the ground truth and the model only at samples from the data distribution. So in low data density regions, we don't have enough samples and therefore we don't have enough information to infer the true score functions in those regions. And this is a huge obstacle for Langevin dynamics to provide high quality samples because Langevin dynamics will have a lot of trouble exploring and navigate, navigating those low data density regions. So how can we address this challenge? One idea is to inject Gaussian noise to perturb our data points. So after adding enough Gaussian noise, we perturb the data points to everywhere in the space this means the size of low data density regions becomes smaller. So in the context of image generation, adding additional Gaussian noise 
means we inject Gaussian noise to perturb each pixel of the image. So in this toy example, you can see that after injecting the right amount of Gaussian noise, the estimated scores now become accurate almost everywhere. And this phenomenon is very promising because it at least says that those score functions or noisy data densities are much easier to be estimated accurately. And those score functions of noisy densities could provide valuable directional information to guide language dynamics to move from low data density regions to high data density regions. But simply injecting Gaussian noise will not solve all the problem because after perturbation of data points, those noisy data densities are no longer good approximations to the original true data density. To, so to solve this problem, we propose to use a multiple uh, a sequence of different noise levels. So as a poor example, we consider three noise levels from sigma one to sigma three. We use Gaussian noise of mean zero and standard deviation from sigma one to sigma three to perturb our training data set. And this will give us three noisy training data sets. For each noisy data set, there will be a corresponding noisy data density, which we denote as P sigma one to P sigma three. So in the context of images, perturbation using multiple, no multiple levels of noise will give you a sequence of images uh, demonstrated here. So after obtaining those noisy data sets, we want to estimate the underlying density. We want to estimate the underlying score function of the corresponding noisy data densities. So how can we estimate three noisy score functions? Well, the most naive approach is we train three networks and uh, uh, each network is responsible for estimating the score function of a single noise level. But this is not a scalable solution because in practice, we might require much more noise levels. For example, um, our image generation, we typically require hundreds to thousands of noise levels. A more scalable solution is to consider a conditional score model, which we call a noise conditional score model. A noise conditional score model is a simple modification to a score model. It takes the noise level sigma as one additional input dimension to the model. The output corresponds to the score function of the uh, data density perturbed with noise level sigma. So how can we train this noise conditional score model? Well, again, we can leverage the idea of a score matching. We have an important modification of score matching to jointly train the score model across all, level, all levels. So in this modification, we have a summation of score matching losses. We have one score matching loss for each noise level sigma i, and we have a positive weighting function, lambda sigma i. So the value of this weighting function is typically chosen using empirical heuristics. It can also be derived using principled analysis of the problem. We have this positive weighting function just want to balance the scales of a score matching loss across all noise levels. And this is helpful for optimization. So by minimizing this modified score matching loss, if our optimizer is powerful enough, and if our model is expressive enough, then we, we will obtain accurate score estimation for all, for all noise levels. So after training this noise conditional score model, how do we generate samples? Um, well, uh, one additional note is that this mixture of a score matching loss function is actually a generalization to the training objective of the first version of diffusion probabilistic models proposed in 2015. And this connects score based genetic models to diffusion models. The connection between score based models and diffusion models was first unveiled by the DDPM paper, which was in 2020. So now, Let's return to the question of how to sample from the noise conditional score model after training with the score matching loss. Well, we can still use Langevin dynamics. We can first apply Langevin dynamics to sample from the score model with the biggest perturbation noise. And the samples will be used as, as initialization to sample from the score model of the next noise level. And we continue in this fashion until finally we generate samples from the score function with the smallest noise level. We call this sampling procedure a new the Langevin dynamics 
because the rough intuition is we hope to gradually anneal down the temperature of our data density to gradually reduce the noise level. And this is what it looks like when we apply this approach to modeling real images. So it's quite remarkable that we can start from a random noise, then modify those images according to the score model, and this can eventually give us nice looking samples. And uh, this is the result of this simple noise conditional score model approach in 2019. So uh, we provide the inception scores and FRD scores on CIPA 10 dataset. Those inception scores and FRDs are important quantities for comparing the performance of different genetic models in terms of a sample quality. So this was the first time that a different method can outperform GANs in terms of achieving higher inception score. So of course, FRD score is still lagging behind GANs, but uh, like uh, at that time, it was quite surprising that a simple proof can already outperform GANs in one important metric, uh, which is the uh, inception score. So why it is important to outperform GANs? Because GANs was the best genetic model for sample generation, especially for images, for quite a while. And the, as the Turing world winner, Yana Kun has said that GANs are the most interesting idea in the last 10 years in machine learning. And indeed, GANs have attracted a lot of research efforts from big corporations and universities, and people have improved GANs so much, spent so much engineering effort on it. It is, um, it is amazing to see that GANs can generate the very nice looking images. But it is quite amazing that we can actually outperform GANs with score-based genetic models. And uh, like uh, with the resource available in academia, we actually do not have much capability to tune those kind of score models well enough. So uh, especially considering the imbalance between computer resources and engineering efforts spent on GANs and score-based models, I consider this as a, a very surprising achievement. So of course, noise conditional score models can be applied to other type of uh, image generation tasks, including images of different objects and uh, of different resolution. So with some later development on score matching techniques and uh, the neural network model architectures, we can further improve the sample quality on c And of course, nowadays diffusion models have captured so much attention and uh, People are now working on diffusion, trying to improve their various perspectives. So it's not unexpected that people are achieving better and better quality using diffusion models or score-based models. So in this work, uh, we again tackle the data set of CIFAR 10. The left figure shows some existing training images from the CIFAR 10 data set. The right figure shows the newly generated samples from this improved approach. So now you can see newly generated samples look very realistic and very diverse. They are also different from existing training images. You cannot generate such images by simply memorizing the training dataset. And again, we compare with the best GAN approach in terms of FRD scores and inception scores. So now we are able to outperform the best GAN approach in terms of both FRD scores and inception scores. And this means Score-based models can challenge the runtime dominance of guys in image generation. The same approach can be extended to generate images of very large resolution. So here are two samples generated from a score-based model. Each one has the resolution of 1024 by 1024. And here are more such samples from the same model with the same resolution. So you can see the samples are very high quality, quite comparable to the best GAN approaches at that time. So one remarkable property of a score-based generative modeling is the capability to control the generative process in a principled way. So suppose that given an unconditional score-based genetic model that generates images of uh, uh, dogs, but we want to, uh, that generates images of both dogs and cats, but we want to only generate images of dogs. So how can we do that? Let's suppose that given a forward model. So this forward model is basically an image classifier that gives us the label of an image Y from any image X. 
we want to specify a control signal, which is a target label Y. We want to specify the target label to be dot. And then we hope to sample from the conditional distribution of X given Y. This conditional distribution will provide images of dogs only. It is called the inverse distribution because you can view it as a probabilistic inversion of the forward model. So how can we obtain this inverse distribution? The standard approach is to leverage the Bayes rule. So in Bayes rule, we have access to the unconditional distribution Px. We are given the forward model, but we don't know the denominator. So this denominator is exactly the normalizing constant of the inverse distribution. This means we can use score functions to again bypass this challenge in Bayes rule. And we can derive the Bayes rule for score functions very easily. So the derivation is very simple. We just take the logarithm on both sides of Bayes rule and then take the gradient. Again, we can find that the only term that depends on the denominator goes away. The score function of the inverse distribution now becomes a simple summation with two terms. Well, the first term is the unconditional score function that can be estimated by training an unconditional score model. The second term is the gradient of the log forward model. In this particular application of uh, conditional image generation, the forward model is a classifier and the gradient can be very easily computed using bank propagation. In some other applications, this forward model might be manually specified and the gradient is actually analytically tractable in most cases. So nice, the nice thing of this decomposition is now we can plug in different forward models or exactly the same score model, which means we only need to train our unconditional score model once. Then we can repurpose this unconditional score model for various conditional generation applications just by switching the forward model. This is one example. We can train one unconditional score model of C pattern images, then couple it with a classifier to generate class conditional samples. Here, the forward model is a time dependent classifier. It is time dependent because we consider a sequence of score functions, and this means we need to have a sequence of classifiers. So the figures demonstrate the conditional generation results of CIFAR 10. We have like births, we have deers, all from an unconditional score based model. And this approach has been further developed as classifier gardens or classifier free gardens in subsequent works. And nowadays it is the standard technique used in all the text to image generation approaches like uh, DALI 2 or Imagine. We can use an unconditional score based model for imaging painting. So here, the control signal is the masked image. We only know uh, we only know some partial regions of the image. And we want to sample from the inverse distribution, which gives us completed images from a partially observed image. In this case, the forward model can be directly specified using our uh, domain expertise. So there is no need to train a separate model for this task. And similarly, we can apply unconditional, unconditional score-based models for image colorization. And again, uh, in this figure, you can see that our target, our control signal is the gray image, and we can infer the colorized images from the gray images. The forward model can be specified manually for this image in painting and the image colorization, colorization tasks. We were actually using the same unconditional score model. We're actually using the same unconditional score model. <clears throat> So this means that one scope estimate model uh, can be used for both imaging painting and the colorization, demonstrating the flexibility of this decomposition of the inverse score function. And again, we can apply this approach to larger scale uh, examples, such as colorization for images or resolution 1024 by 1024. So the same approach can be applied to convert stroke patterns to realistic images. And here is one example. Now the stroke patterns become the control signal and we use an unconditional score-based model trained on realistic images only. They have no idea of what a stroke pattern looks like. We can develop the forward model 
by manual, manual specification using our domain expertise. And this is another example, language guided image generation. In this case, we are based on an unconditional Scopaster model. And uh, the target, uh, the control signal becomes a language description, treehouse in the Star Wars Studio Ghibli animation. The forward model is given by an image commissioning neural network. So uh, in this example, the SCOP model has no knowledge of language at all, but it is capable of generating spatial images and conform with the language description. And this is another example. We can apply conditional score based generation for medical image reconstruction. And we consider the special problem of computed tomography. So in this case, um, we use x-rays to shoot through human body. Those x-rays will hit the detector to form observations called sparse field sonogram. We can invert this uh, physical procedure to obtain those cross-sectional medical image. So here the control signal is a sonogram. The inverse distribution gives you the conditional medical images, conditional distribution of medical images given this sonogram. We want to consider the problem of sparse view computed tomography, meaning that we want to use as few X-rays as possible to reduce radiation. And this is a very suitable task for generative models because by training an unconditional generative model on large scale medical images, our generative models can actually learn what a typical medical image looks like. It can learn very useful image prior and this can be subsequently used to reduce the number of X-ray projections. In this case, the forward model is given by physical simulation. So there is no need to train any separate conditional model for uh, capturing this forward model. And we can have some results on real-world CT datasets. We consider the task of using 23 projections while in contrast, typical um, traditional approaches require like hundreds to thousands of projections. So this is the result of a traditional approach based on compressed sensing. So using only 23 projections, you can see the medical image is quite blurry. Quantitatively, we compare the performance of different algorithms using PSNR and SSIN. Here are the results of two deep neural network based approaches. So those methods are based on mapping projections directly to images. So they are kind of limited to a particular training setting. In this case, since they are trained on 23 projections, it is hard to adapt them to different number of projections later. And this is our fully unsupervised approach. So because we only train one unconditional score-based model, we do not train any particular model associated with this 23 projection. So that means we can adapt the same model to different settings, like changing the number of projections later after training. And this is the ground truth. So both qualitatively and quantitatively, you can see that this scope-based uh, medical image construction approach can actually outperform other deep learning methods. Even though this generative approach is fully unsupervised, does not uh, bind to a particular experimental setting, while in contrast, existing deep learning methods have to be limited to a specific experimental setting. So similar success has also been observed on accelerated magnetic resonance imaging as well. And there has been numerous developments of scope-based genetic models or diffusion models. They have obtained state of the art performance and many other tasks. And uh, this is already kind of outdated and it's time, but I think it's worth mentioning uh, anyways. So we can generate high quality images for much more complicated data set like ImageNet. And we can obtain outstanding performance on audio synthesis, text to speech generation, material design. This is actually a paper by MIT researchers and also shape generation. We can also use scope-based approaches for molecular confirmation prediction and time series prediction. And there is a website called scope-based genetic modeling.github.io that includes a list of uh, relevant works trying to building, try to build upon the technology of diffusion and trying to improve the methodology 
of scope based chip models. <laughs> so, uh, for now, I have talked about how scope based genetic modeling allows flexible model architectures, allows improved sample quality with a controllable generation procedure. In the last part of the tutorial, I will talk about how we can compute probability values accurately and how we can outperform existing uh, likelihood based genetic models in terms of density estimation. So in order to compute accurate probability values, we have to generalize the previous framework from using a finite number of noise labels to using an infinite number of noise labels. So let's get some intuition first by assuming our data distribution is a one dimensional mixture of two Gaussians. And let's start with three noise labels. We have sigma one to sigma three, and we use Gaussian noise of a standard deviation from sigma one to sigma three to perturb our data distribution. So if the noise level is large enough, we can convert any data distribution into a simple Gaussian distribution. We may use a one dimensional heat map to represent each of those noisy data densities. With more noise levels, we have more heat maps. And in the limit of infinite noise levels, we have a continuous two dimensional heat map that represents an infinite number of noisy data densities. We use PT to represent each of those noisy data density, where T is a continuous parameter ranging between zero and capital T, where capital T, capital T is a fixed constant. When T is a zero, P zero is the same of the data density because we do not inject any Gaussian noise at this time instant. When T is capital T, P capital T contains a lot of Gaussian noise. It would be close to a simple Gaussian distribution, which we denote as pi x. So suppose we are given this sequence of infinite number of uh, noise levels, how do we generate noisy data how do we generate noisy data sets for training our SCAR models? Well, we need to leverage the intuition of stochastic processes. So starting from clean training data points, we progressively inject Gaussian noise to perturb our training data sets. So after enough perturbation, eventually we will obtain very noisy images, uh, which are close to samples from a simple Gaussian distribution. So the trajectory of those noisy data sets form the trajectories of a stochastic process. A stochastic process is basically a, a collection of an infinite number of random variables. Here, those random variables are indexed by the continuous parameter t. For each random variable, there will be a corresponding probability density. So one stochastic process corresponds to an infinite number of probability densities. So how, to, how do we choose the right stochastic process such that it represents an infinite number of noisy data densities? Well, we use the tool of a stochastic differential equation. So a stochastic differential equation is very similar to an ordinary differential equation, but it has one additional stochastic term. In the general form of our SDEs, we have one deterministic drift term that controls the deterministic properties of the stochastic process we have one stochastic term which involves DWT, the infinitesimal Gaussian noise. So without loss of a generality, I will consider the following toy formulation of the SDE, which does not have the deterministic drift term. And it has a very simple stochastic term, sigma t. You can view sigma t as a continuous time generalization of noise label, uh, of noise label sigma i, uh, which we introduced before. So now we have an infinite number of uh, noisy data sets. How do we generate samples? Suppose we can estimate their score functions. Well, the sample generation process amounts to a time reversal of the perturbation process. So by reversing the perturbation process, we can start from causing noise, then progressively denoise to generate noise-free samples. How do we obtain this reverse stochastic process? Recall that our forward stochastic process is given by a stochastic differential equation. It turns out that any stochastic differential equation of that form can be reversed in analytical form, and this gives us the reverse stochastic differential equation. The reverse stochastic differential equation depends on an infinitesimal noise term, dWt bar. So this is very similar to dWt, but it makes sense only when time flows backwards. 
It also depends on the score function of the noisy data density PT. So now with the forward and backward uh, SDEs, we can generalize the previous score-based genetic modeling approach to using uh, infinite noise levels. In this formulation, the key is to estimate the score function, which we uh, accomplish by modeling the time com by parameterizing the time conditional score model. So we hope to train this time conditional score model to approximate the score function of the data density and time instant t. And again, the training procedure depends on score matching. We have one score matching loss for any time instant t. We have a positive weighting function lambda t to balance the optimization procedure. And we have generalized the summation to an expectation over t. So uh, after training with this score matching objective, we can obtain a good time conditional score based model that approximates the score function of noisy data densities. And uh, of course, training involves minimizing this score matching objective, and we can train it efficiently using denoisy score matching or sliced score matching. After training, we can plug our time conditional score model into the reverse time SDE. And then we can use any numerical SDE solver to solve this reverse time SDE for sample generation. And one simple approach is the Euler Mariama approach, which is the stochastic generalization to the classical Euler solver for ordinary differential equations. So with this continuous SDE approach, we not only improve empirical performance, we can also finally uh, discuss how we can compute the accurate probability values. And this requires to convert the stochastic differential equation to an ordinary differential equation. So with the right SDE, we can convert any data distribution to the Gaussian distribution. It turns out that we can do the same thing by using ordinary differential equations. So the trajectory of the ODE and the SDE look quite different from each other but actually they can share the same set of marginal densities as given by the background. So uh, for any SDE of this form, we show that the corresponding ordinary differential equation named probability flow D has the form on the right side. So again, this OD only relies on the score function. And since we have the time conditional score model, we can plug it into the OD. And then we can solve the OD in various ways. So after substituting this model into the ODE, we can solve the probability flow ODE backwards in time by starting from some samples from the Gaussian distribution. And this ODE trajectories gradually convert our Gaussian vectors into high quality image samples. And we denote the resulting distribution of samples from this ODE solver as P theta. So now I will show you how to compute the accurate value of P theta. So uh, uh, recall that we define this probability distribution in this way. We have prior Gaussian distribution. We have time conditional score model. By solving the ODE, we get the distribution of P theta. So this is actually a bijection. So why we need to compute the exact likelihood because they have many useful applications. We also mentioned this briefly before. This includes lossless compression, unsupervised uh, anomaly detection, generative classification, density estimation, and so on. And the formula for this likelihood is given by the following uh, equation. So this equation connects log p theta on any data point x naught with the log prior distribution log pi and also one dimensional integral that involves the choice of the Jacobian of the score model. So the choice can be computed using an unbiased estimator and the integral can be computed using an OD solver. This integral is simple to evaluate because it is a one-dimensional integral. So here are some results of uh, computing the density with this OD approach. So our results are highlighted with the green box. And we re report results in negative log likelihoods, which are better than lower. And in this table, you can see that we can achieve lower negative log likelihood on almost all previous approaches, even though our methods are not explicitly trained for maximum likelihood. I mentioned that the um, 
weighting function lambda t can be chosen using some theoretically principled approach. And indeed, we can do that to specifically maximize maximum likelihood. So there is a theorem we showed that there is an important connection between the KL divergence and the score matching objective. And this uh, connection looks like below. Here, the second term, KL divergence from P capital T to pi is approximately zero if capital T is large enough. And this term does not affect optimization because it, it does not depend on model parameter theta. The first term is exactly our score matching objective, but with a different weighting function. So this weighting function is sigma t squared, which we call the likelihood weighting, because KL divergence is directly related to maximum likelihood training. By minimizing the score matching loss function with this particular likelihood weighting function, we are actually implicitly maximizing likelihood. And this, should, uh, because this score matching loss function is very efficient to optimize, this also gives a way for efficient maximum likelihood training for score based diffusion models. And with this approach, we can further improve the density values on several test datasets. Again, we report results in negative log probability, which is lower, which is better when lower. And here are some existing results. Those are state of the art likelihood based genetic models that achieve very good likelihood values on two image datasets, CIFAR 10 and ImageNet. And here is our result, which achieves um, very good likelihood 2.83 on CIFAR 10. This is second to the state of the art. We also achieved the new state of the art likelihood on ImageNet 32 by 32. And this demonstrates that score based genetic models or diffusion models can not only challenge the dominance of GANs on image generation quality, but can also challenge the dominance of autoregression models and the VAEs on obtaining high likelihood values. So, aside from probability evaluation, there are also a few nice properties with the probability flow. D. One example is we can perform latent space manipulation because this ODE actually connects score-based models to normalizing flows or latent space genetic models. We can manipulate the latent space for applications such as image interpolation, which we show on the left side, or temperature scaling, which we show on the right side. And there is one unique property associated with the probability flow D. That is, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it recovers latent code that is uniquely identifiable. So what does it mean? For traditional latent based, uh, for traditional latent space genetic models, such as VAEs, GANs, or normalizing flows, if you train two models with different architectures, or if you train them with different optimizers, then they will map the same image, the same data point X to different latent code Z. But in the case of the probability flow, the things are a bit different. Even if you have different model architectures or different optimizers, as long as the architectures and optimizers are good enough, they will map the same data point into the same latent code Z. And this is because the probability flow D itself actually does not depend on the model parameter at all. So once we have fixed the forward process, this probability flow OD is also fixed. And the mapping between the data point A and the latent code Z is also fixed. So here are some experimental results. We trained two model architectures on the same CIFAR 10 data set. And we, up, we plot the first 100 dimensions of the latent code for a fixed CIFAR 10 image input. You can see that the latent code is almost the same, even though we were using two different model architectures Trained, trained separately. So as a summary, we have talked about score-based genetic models. It has multiple desirable properties. The first, it allows very flexible neural network models. And uh, because the score functions can bypass the normalizing constant, and we can train those flexible models from data with principled statistical methods. And second, we can generate samples with a very high quality that can even surpass GANs in many challenging image generation tasks. And moreover, we can control this, we can control this generation process for important applications in conditional image generation, 
and also inverse from the solving. And finally, we can compute probability values accurately, even though we only have sample, we only have models of the score function. And empirically, we can even obtain better density estimation performance than existing likelihood-based genetic models. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I was wondering whether you could comment um, a little bit more on the um, link between the forward models and then the score-based function. Um, because for instance, you're saying that it could be like a physical simulation. It can be like an image to text network. What is, what are the requirements or what is, what could be like the forward model? What are the limits to what that model can be? Yeah, so ideally the forward model has to condition a noise level T as well, just like the score function. So if you have such a forward model, then you can generate from the conditional distribution exactly just like a class conditional generation, text to image synthesis. So in all those cases, we have a forward model conditioned on noise label. If we don't have such a noise label, which is the case in medical image reconstruction, we need to develop approximation approaches. So if the forward model is linear, then it is typically easy to approximate it. And there are already uh, a sequence of uh, follow-up works and demonstrate different uh, methods for approximating the forward model. So if this forward model is nonlinear, then approximation is a little bit more complicated, but it is not impossible. So there are also relevant works on that. Um, it is still a research direction whether there exists a principled way to convert a single forward model to a sequence of forward models that condition on the noise level T. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. Um, do you have any intuition on why diffusion models outperform GANs? Are there cases in which diffusion models underperform GANs slash VAEs in terms of performance? Yes, so uh, this is still an open question because people don't have even any understanding of why GANs have better sample quality now we use autoregression models and other things. But I can offer some intuition and some uh, guess uh, about where, why diffusion models generate samples of better quality. So my first hypothesis is that because diffusion models have very flexible neural network architectures. So architectures are critical in the performance of deep genetic models, even for guys the importance of architect and the importance of architecture cannot be underestimated. For example, GANs did not really have good performance until people have invented DC GAN architecture and more recently style GAN architectures. Mm -hmm. And this is the same case in diffusion models. Because of the score functions do not have to be normalized, you can use almost arbitrary neural network architectures. And this offers a lot of advantages. For example, nowadays, all the diffusion models are based on unit type architectures. If you change them to some other type of architecture, the performance usually degrades a lot. But because diffusion models allow us to use flexible architectures, we have more, uh, freedom, we have more degree of freedom to try different type of architectures. And some of those neural, net, neural network architectures are extreme, extremely powerful for uh, other computer vision tasks. For example, units were initially used in image segmentation and some other dense prediction tasks. And not, that's also the reason why we tried units in scope-based genetic models. So because of this extra degree of freedom, we can use very good deep neural, deep neural network architectures. And this helps in terms of sample quality. So another hypothesis on why diffusion outperform GANs is based on the observation that diffusion models generate samples with better diversity. So why they compare the diversity? Because there is a strong connection between the score matching laws and maximum likelihood. And maxi ma maximum likelihood is, a, is an objective that promotes high likelihood. So when we are training diffusion models, we are also implicitly maximizing likelihood to some degree. And that means we have better diversity in a sense. So another reason why diffusion outperforms scans is due to the reason that we can decompose the conditional score function into two terms. And uh, discussed in the tutorial before, uh, the 
score function is decomposed into the sum of the unconditional score function and the gradient of the forward model. So we can actually reweight the gradient of the, of the forward model to trade off diversity and uh, image fidelity. And this technique called classifier guidance or classifier free guidance, which was later developed further by OpenAI people and Google people, those techniques have become absolutely important for the like, text image generation approaches. Without this kind of a guidance, the samples will have much worse quality. So for guidance, it is uh, much less intuitive to enforce this kind of a classifier guidance. So that's also why one reason why diffusion models are performed GANs. So in cases where diffusion models underperform GANs or VAEs, I think one example is a sample sampling speed, uh, because diffusion models require a sequence of an iterative sample generation procedure. This means we have to evaluate the score model for multiple times. While in GANs or VAEs, you only need to evaluate the image generator. Uh, with one network evaluation. So it is much faster in that case. So there are already a lot of progress for accelerating the sampling speed of uh, diffusion models. So in the future, I think this, um, this part will become less and less important. Another thing is related to the latent space. So for diffusion, we can define the latent space through the probability flow D. But this latent space is less disentangled compared to the latent space in GANs or VAEs. So this is uh, one drawback because people can use the semantic latent space of GANs or VAEs for a lot of uh, innovative image editing tasks. But in the case of diffusion, this is much harder to do. However, this is not a big issue from my perspective because um, all those text to image generation models are actually mostly based on diffusion models. And in those cases, when you have a text to image generating model, you can basically view the text uh, description as one Latin code. So now you convert the Latin space into the space of language descriptions. And I believe language descriptions are the best Latin space for any type of image editing. It is interpretable, it is very easy to manipulate. So in that regard, I think, uh, it is less harmful for diffusion models to not have a, a similar latent space as in GANs and VAEs. So yeah, so that was a long answer. I hope that addresses your question. And you briefly touched upon this in your answer, but what is the main architecture type that is being used in current diffusion models? And how large are they compared to other state-of-the-art <laughs> neural networks? Yeah, so uh, right now we still use UNET architectures. Units are very similar to residents, but they have some additional skip connections connecting feature maps with the same resolution. And uh, in terms of the size of model architectures, diffusion models can be can be very large. Like they can be uh, as large as the largest image generated models from other categories. But compared to language models, they are still relatively small. So all the recent uh, text to image genetic models have parameter count around like uh, a few billions. But the language, the biggest language models on text can have parameters up to hundreds of billions. So uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's still a big difference here. And uh, people are still on the way of uh, scaling diffusion models to uh, those as large as language models. And uh, I don't think there is any fundamental difficulty in scaling them to larger and larger models. Wait, could, could you explain what, what you said about the, the latent code being less disentangled? Is, is there a reason why, why there'd be a difference between diffusion models? And I, I guess VAEs kind of implicitly have a, a, a term to encourage that, that semantic disentangling, but, but I don't understand why yeah. the would do that better either. Yeah. So. Uh... I think these entanglements in GANs and VEs are mostly in empirical observation. So somehow these this entangled codes are much easier to work with uh, and are much useful for improving sample quality in those kinds of genetic models. So for diffusion models, because the latent code is not related to like the neural network architecture or the optimization procedure, 
the latent code is entirely defined by the forward perturbation process. So you can view the latent code as analogous to some hyperparameter. And this like manually constructed latent code is unfortunately not as disentangled as those latent code in GANs of AEs. In that if you change one dimension of the latent code and observe how the image change in diffusion models, the image might change in some random ways. It's not, not like GANs of AEs when you are mod modifying a particular latent code dimension, the image will change uh, in a very predictable, predictable way. So I think it's just uh, because how we design those diffusion models, the latent code really don't have much semantics. Uh, there might be ways to design a forward process such that the latent code is fully disentangled. Um, so it could be a good future research direction. Now we have another question from the chat, which is, can diffusion models be used for transfer learning? Uh, for instance, fine tuning? Recent self-supervised method used image reconstruction by recovering the masked pixels, such as masked autoencoders. In terms of learning representation, which strategy do you think would be preferred? Denoising images step-by-step step or recovering masked pixels at once? So anyway, so from my understanding, um, there are a lot of uh, similarities between masked self-supervised learning and diffusion models. The biggest difference might be in diffusion models, we have um, multiple noise levels. So the objective actually consists of a summation of different masks auto encoding losses. There might be some difference in terms of uh, what kind of uh, uh, perturbation and denoising process we use. In mask auto encoders, the perturbation is uh, basically masking out part of the image and the denoising process, um, process amounts to recovering the missing pixels in the particular region. In Gaussian diffusion models, we perturb images by adding Gaussian noise and denoise by re removing those Gaussian noise. So you can also construct diffusion models by using the perturbation process in mask autoencoders, which means you can progressively remove part of the image and then progressively recover those missing pixels. So you can use similar uh, similar procedure for self-supervised representation learning as well. And uh, there has been some recent works on that. Uh, in that case, you will obtain representations as a function of noise level. And this continuous formulation of the representation might be useful for some downstream tasks as well, just like mask autoencoders. So which strategy it should be preferred? Uh, this is hard to say. I think only experiments can, can give you the definite answer. And uh, but both approaches are reasonable and they are always trying. In terms of a transfer learning or fine tuning, um, so it really depends on like what kind of diffusion models you want to use. There are some recent work on text to image generation diffusion models, like you can fine tune DALI 2 or, or imagine or tasks like dream, dream boost or texture inversion. Um, I don't think that's much different from other genetic models in terms of capabilities for transfer learning or fine tuning. Yeah, there is another question. Does diffusion model also have overfitting and mode collapse? If so, how to deal with these problems? So that's a good question. So diffusion models also overfit and also have mode collapse. And uh, in terms of overfitting, like it's quite easy to um, to detect overfitting in diffusion models because you can just compare the loss curve for training and test. If the test loss curve is uh, going up, then it uh, indicates uh, clear overfitting. So for some small image data sets like CIFAR 10, overfitting is very important to, um, it's very important to suppress overfitting in order to obtain samples of a high quality. And we typically just drop out of wet decay. For larger data sets like ImageNet, because there are so many images there, it's becoming harder and harder to overfit. However, it is still possible for diffusion models to memorize certain images in the training data set. This is called the image uh, regurgitation, I think. Uh, this was observed in DALI 2 training as well. And this is typically caused by like, repetition of certain images in the training data set. 
if there are a lot of similar images and more or less the same with each other in the training data set, then it is very likely for the diffusion model to completely memorize such images. And the way to mitigate this problem is to do image deduplication. So basically remove all the simple similar images. And uh, or another way to do it is to increase the size of the training data set. Like if you have uh, a lot of uh, different images and a lot of images are repeated in similar ways, then it is also helpful for the diffusion model to avoid memorizing such images. Um, so it diffusion model do not have like more uh, similar, like they have some kind of mode collapse, but not in the same way as GANs. Because in GANs mode collapse usually happens when the training is done poorly. But for diffusion models, the mode collapse you really happen because of the data set. Um, so yeah, that's a very interesting difference. So in, in the score-based models, like there's usually a sigma term, I, I think that you introduced. And, and you said that one of the reasons why you want this is, is for kind of perform or uh, sort of like tractability uh, reasons. Do you, do you think that the weight sharing that this also introduces is important for, for kind of the models to do well, or is it kind of just an artifact of reusing the same model? Yeah, web sharing is also important uh, on some small scale problems. So I have never tried this on large scale problems. On some small scale problems, it is possible to train a separate score network for each individual noise label and it performs fine. So it is definitely not a scalable solution. Um, so nobody has tried this on very large scale problems, but there is indication that this may also work for large scale problems because some of the recent text to image diffusion models like Edify, they actually have multiple separate score models. So some of the score models are responsible for high noise levels. Some of them are responsible for middle noise levels and some responsible for small noise levels. And this can indeed greatly improve the performance. So from this perspective, I don't think wet sharing is the most important thing for to explain is a high sample quality. And uh, if you have the computing resource to do it separately, then maybe it can be much better. <laughs>